This was before I knew this passage. I think God has a message for us. God has a, a point that He wants you and I to catch. And let's catch it this afternoon. Let's pray. We pray and ask God because, Lord, we want to hear you and know that you are speaking to us today. More than a presentation, more than a person speaking, we want to hear you. So speak, Lord, for we, your servants, are listening. Thank you, Lord. Amen. In Ephesians 1, we find amongst the many, many things that you and I would normally pray for, for each other and so on and so forth, we find a prayer that is made for you and for me to pray for one another and to keep on praying. And I want to invite you now to just take some time to read that prayer in Ephesians 1 verse 17 to 19 and continuing a second part in chapter 3 verse 16 to 19. And as you read that, allow the Spirit to speak to you. Hear Him. How many of us, or rather how few of us, pray like this? And it's interesting also because with Paul's great wisdom and skill and ability and command of the Greek language, he writes in a way that seems to be going on and on and there's so much packed into a few short sentences, which really is just a few sentences. It seems like there's so much there that I'm not sure that I got it the first time I read it. I'm not sure whether you feel the same. My prayer this week and for now has been that we will together understand this prayer that Paul makes for believers and also non-believers because this letter in, of, to the Ephesians was a letter that was given and circulated among gathered congregations in Ephesus in Asia. It was for people like you and I, when we are gathered, there are those of us who are followers of Christ already, and there are those of us who are not yet followers of Christ. It's a prayer that is true for non-believers, but it is made for believers of Jesus. Look carefully, in verse 15, Paul, under the Spirit's leading, says, I am talking to people and I am praying for people who already have faith in Jesus. Get this right, because this will change the way that we understand 
Paul's prayer or God's way of teaching us to pray. It is four people who are already in faith in Jesus, four people who already love God's people. And so while it is true for non-believers, this prayer is true, holds true for non-believers, it is made for people like you and I. Verse 16, Paul says, And I have kept on praying. I have not stopped praying. It's a prayer that he makes over and over again. Verse 17a, he says, I keep asking of God. And verse 17, second half, he says, More and more. Something about this prayer, as we are going to learn, is a prayer made not just for someone who doesn't know or doesn't believe in God now. It's made for you and I who are already in Christ and will continue to be made. It is a prayer that you and I should continue to make for you and I. You pray for me and I pray for you in the same way. You pray for yourself this way as I will pray for myself this way. Let's learn together. What is this prayer that God would have us ask Him for one another and to help us because the sentences are so long and so much English and so many things stuck together I want to try to help us with some pictures some animation uh, a little bit of graphic if you like to help us understand the heart and the mind of God shown through us through Paul the first thing that Paul asks and prays to God and asks God for is that God would give us his spirit. Verse 17, I ask that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, He will give you His spirit, which is a spirit, it is the spirit, it is the spirit that has all wisdom and all revelation. And why does Paul ask for God to envelope us, if I may say, or influence or fill us or surround us inside and around us with His Spirit. Why? So that we will know Him better. How appropriate. The Spirit who has all wisdom and all revelation to help us know God better. The word know here is an interesting word. It doesn't simply mean, ah, 我知道. In Chinese, I love the way that the, 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 the words are more carefully crafted out. It's not just a Head knowledge. The word know, as this picture tries to bring across, is that idea of recognition. 我认识, not just 我知道. 我知道, so and so, but 不等于我认识. I may know, but I may not recognize, or I might not acknowledge. And so Paul starts off, and God teaches us, pray for yourself, pray for each other, that he gives us his spirit, that we may recognize Him. We may see Him face to face and not just as some kind of distant deity. Can I pause here and remind us again? This is a prayer made for Christians, for believers, for followers of God. So don't make the wrong assumption, the mistake to say, oh, this is a prayer for non-believers because they need to see God, they need to know God. Oh, we who already are in the faith in God still need to know Him better, know Him more. Day to day, if God's Spirit would continue to pour out on us as He has already poured out, started to pour out, He still fills and influences us every day, more and more, this Spirit of revelation and wisdom will let us see God face to face and more of who He is. You will recognize and you will know God not only in theory, you will know Him in person. Big difference, folks. It's a prayer that we need to make for ourselves, for one another. And very quickly then, having face-to-face with God, Paul, under the Spirit's leading, teaches us and he prays for us that God would open our eyes. God would open our eyes to see what? Three things. Hope, inheritance, and 
Hello. It's in the text. It's on the slide. And power. The hope, the inheritance, and the power that God gives to us. Look at verse 18 and 19. The hope to which He has called us. Remember, this is not merely for a non-Christian, a non-believer. The riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints or in His holy people and His incomparably great power for us who believe. Well, it sounds like a wonderful statement to say, you know, if, if Paul was running for president, he would make a great speech this way. It's a great chunk of words, but do we know what it means? It's a great string of words also because it's in the Bible. It's God's own words. But what is this hope? What is this inheritance? And what is this power? Let me give you 20 seconds to turn to someone around you and to tell him or her what you think this hope is or this inheritance is or this power. And you try, you choose one. No need to do all three unless you're very garang. Choose one that you think you know very well and tell it to your partner and if you can, with scriptural evidence or to convince your partner that you are right. Listen to me, okay? 30 seconds, let's go. What is this hope that he has called you to and I? What's this inheritance that is in store for us? And what power is God talking about? Go! Now, a biblical understanding, an answer from the scripture is important because if you were to tell a non-believer, not yet follower of Christ, I have hope, I have an inheritance, and I have power, and he or she turns around and says, tell me more. See me hope you have. What inheritance is in store? And what power are you talking about? You and I need to have a good answer, and not only a good answer, a right answer. Now, I wish we had time to discuss this together and I'm sure we'll get a complete answer then but I'd like to share with you as I search through scripture for my own answers which now I'm convinced also are God's answers because they are from scripture. I'd like to share with you and ask you to open your eyes to see how much bigger this hope, inheritance and power is than we normally think. When God says He has called us into a hope, what hope is this? This is not merely a ticket to heaven. Hello. Scripture throughout, and I'm going to put some references there for you. We start from Paul himself. He's consistent in his talking, in his arguments. And then after that, the Apostle John as well tells us the hope that you and I have, the, ex- the supreme hope that you and I have, is that of becoming like Jesus Christ. Becoming like Jesus Christ, listen, in our being, our character, and in our body, physically. Christ's likeness in character now, and very soon, Christ's likeness in body, when you and I are taken home to be with Him. This is our hope. Even though today, sometimes it seems a long shot still, God tells us we have been called out of darkness and we can and we will even now become increasingly more and more like Him and finally fully like Him 
in character, in being, in body. And that is what eternal life is more fully described as. The being and the living just like Jesus. This hope tells us you and I are not stuck as who we are today because God can make us and God will make us like His Son, Jesus. He states that in His own word. It's a hope for people like you and I who find ourselves constantly stuck with sinfulness or with struggling or with unspirituality. And he says, don't give it up yet. Because day by day, increasingly, you can have the hope of Christ's likeness. I let you read the proof text, the supporting text on your own. And having the hope of Christ's likeness, God further tells us we have an inheritance. And I don't know what you say to each other, but the inheritance that God speaks about in his word in all those messages and more, is an inheritance, a gaining of the Father's glory. Again, if we just say, I gain heaven, we've just so simplified and over-simplified God's word. Because when in Romans 8, we are told that we are co-heirs with Christ. We get what Christ gets. This should give us a clue on how to answer this question. What did Jesus Christ get from his Father? That he says, you too will receive. And the answer is, he gained all things, Hebrews tells us. He inherited all things from his Father. And he inherited, Hebrews and Philippians tells us, the name that is above every name. Put those two together. Christ inherited authority over all things and a name that is more excellent than any name, that is talking about glory. And in case we didn't catch it, the other scriptures will lay it out plainly for us that the Father's glory is given to the Son and so it is to us. This is an inheritance that will never perish, spoil or fade. It is kept in heaven for us. And it's linked it's linked. Christ's likeness is a glory. And I wish we had more time to go deeper into it, but understand, brothers and sisters in Christ, God wants and He says, I give to you the hope of becoming like my Son. I give to you the glory that is mine. And finally, He says, I give to you the power that is in the Spirit that is that same working power, verse 19 to 20 tells us, that was worked in Christ when the Spirit of God raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. This is a power that is able to beat and able to give life, not only physically, but spiritually. It's an incomparably great, it's an immeasurably strong force that is able to work in situations and even in people making the impossible possible. Now I suddenly sound like Paul. Why use so many big words in one sentence? But that's exactly what his word says. It's an incomparably great ESV, immeasurably strong ability working in situations and in people making the impossible possible. Friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, do you know what? Are your eyes open to see what God is saying to you and I, promising us today? He says, I ask that your eyes, the eyes of your soul, your heart, in verse 18, may be enlightened, may you open your eyes and see really the hope of Christ-likeness that you have, the inheritance in store, of you, in store for you of the Father's glory and the power that comes from the Spirit of life. And this is for all, for you who believe. Verse 19. Second Corinthians 3.18 will just wrap up all this together for us. And there is much more we can discover. I'll just pause here and say, at this point, Paul has asked two things. First, 
God's Spirit be given to us who are already in Him, that we may know Him more, and that the eyes of our hearts, our minds, our soul, our very being will be open to see all that God has in store for us now and forever. Hope, inheritance and power. That's his prayer. And then he continues and we move on to chapter 3. After having spoken more about God, and these two, three chapters are all about Christ and about salvation, in chapter 3, he prays and he continues. He says, I ask, I ask God to increase the strength of your soul. I ask God to increase your inner strength. Why? So that you may believe. So that you may believe and therefore God will truly live in you. Having given us all these things, having understood this, Paul still says, I pray that God will increase the strength of your heart, the strength of your inner being. Why? Because without strength of soul, you and I will not place our faith and believe God, even though He has said all that He has said about Himself. And if we do not believe and we do not trust, then He cannot dwell in our hearts. Verse 16 to 17. Out of all these things that God wants to give us, may He still strengthen us with power through His Spirit in our inner being so that Christ will dwell, will stay. And uh, I remember Gareth using an interesting word uh, when he led worship that Christ will tabernacle in our hearts. It's a good word to use. The word tabernacle in the Bible is the same word as dwell, stay, house, temple. Why do we need strength in our inner being? Why do we need strength of heart and mind and soul? Well, because we need to overcome the weak and feebleness of our mind and heart that cannot bring ourselves to believe and trust in God. Is it not true? Even if the Spirit of God has enveloped us and we now know God more, even if our eyes are open to see all that God wants to give to us in Christ, even though we know and we see, if we do not believe and trust, it is not ours. God does not truly dwell or live in us. Our hearts are weak. We know, but we cannot bring ourselves to believe. God is good. And everybody says, easy to say, much harder for your heart to believe, correct? And we can say many things, we can know many things, we can have our eyes open to many things, but if we do not believe, it's lost. It's not real. It's not with us, it's not in us. And so it's so wise of God that He prays, He teaches us to pray for one another, pray for ourselves. Oh God, may I have the strength of my inner being to really believe you, to have faith in you and therefore to allow you to truly live, truly live in me. And that's again a prayer for a a believer, for a Christian. Lord, that you truly live, are living in me all the time, every moment of my life. This reminds me of the father of the child who was bound by a demon in Mark chapter 9. And he says, God, I know you can heal. But I don't believe. I can't believe. Help me, Lord. Help me overcome my belief because I do want to believe. And so we pray for one another. We pray for ourselves. Oh God, increase the strength of our heart that I may exercise faith in you and thereby you dwell in my life truly. The fourth and the last section that Paul prays that God is teaching us to pray for one another is something that I'm excited about. 
it's asking God for the ability. Now that we are already firmly in His love, having Him dwell in us, now that we are already rooted and established in love, now God, now Paul asks and prays that we will have power, that we have full ability together with all of God's people to grasp, to understand, to comprehend how wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Christ. A love that is so big, it not only extends to you and I, and not only to the other saints, the Lord's holy people, but it extends, as John 3.16 tells us, to all the world. Do you and I really capture the depth and the breadth and the height and the length of the love of God? I was rebuked in my heart this week when I say, I know God, I know your love. And then he says, tell me more about it. Kind of, I think I was having a conversation with God that way. Spirit says, tell me more about it. I say, God, you see all that you've done in my life? I thank you for it. I thank you for this. I thank you for that. I thank you. And then after that, God, after letting me go on for a little while, kind of like almost rebuked my heart and says, fantastic. You know my love for you. Is that all you know? How about my love for your family? How about my love for the world that still today rejects me? Do you know that love, Joshua? Or is your understanding of love, as you bless me, then I... That's love, lah. then I love you back. Lah. And so Paul says, and the Spirit teaches us to pray, Lord, can I have the full ability, the power, the understanding of the breadth and the length and the depth and the height of your love? And then very interesting, in verse 19, he says, and English uh, experts will be happy to jump on this sentence, verse 19, to know the love to know this love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Hello? Did you see the contradiction down there? God is asking us to know a love that cannot be known. Huh? Is it a contradiction? Thankfully, in Greek, it helps us. But even without Greek, if you remember what we learned about knowing God, which is not just knowledge, but experience, ah, yes, I can experience a love that cannot be merely understood intellectually. And if God, you will allow me to feel, to, in my emotions, in my real life, even in my application towards other people, experience your love that cannot be merely described by mere intellect or theory. Ah, yes, Lord. Then, we are told in verse 19, last part, we are coming to become filled to the measure of all the fullness of Christ. We are then, in effect, as we understand the love of God, Becoming like Him, just like Him. To be full to that measure of the fullness of God. I'm just like God. I'm full of Christ. I'm full of the Spirit versus I'm full of self. I'm full of pride. I'm full of hot air, talk only. No. Now, God says, I can be full of Him. Knowing love that will cause us to live as a reflection of Christ. That measure of godliness. Impossible? Possible. Why? Verse 20 tells us, because we are asking of Him who is able to do immeasurably more or far more abundantly than all we ask. Asking here. All that we're asking, the four things we're asking here, God can do more than that, 
more than what we ask and more than we can imagine. It's beyond our imagination, God, that I would ever respond to your spirit or experience your spirit and know you more. It's beyond my imagination, God, that somehow or rather in my current state, my eyes can be open to understand hope, inheritance and power. God, is beyond me to be able to know your love and to be able to believe. If you understand my situation, my place in my life now, God, it's not imaginable. And yet, that's our limited understanding. He says He is able to do more than we ask or imagine according to the power, His power that is at work in us. It's amazing. I've read these verses so many times and skipped over the, the words and not capture it. But this time around, by, by the grace of God, He showed me that verse 20, the power that is at work in me is the same power that is that was at work in Christ Jesus to raise him from the dead. I wanted to be sure whether I got this correctly or is this just a word play. I went back and I looked at the Greek and Paul uses the same word under the Spirit's leadership. The working power in Christ Jesus is that same working power in us. Same Spirit, same power, different person. Now I'm beginning to catch a little bit more about hope, a little bit more about inheritance, a little bit more about power. But I had to to make sense of this and just put it in a way that I could grasp and that I pray will help you too. And I say, well, this is the prayer that I must make for myself and I started to make for you and I hope that you will make for one another and I urge you to pray for yourself too. It's a prayer asking that we would have the Spirit to know God better. However little or however much we know of Him today. It starts with an embrace in the Spirit of God. It's a prayer that says, O oh God, may my soul be able to see. Not just my mind, not just my emotions, but everything working together in your spirit. Help me to see all that you have promised that you give to me. Hope, inheritance, power. It's a prayer that our strength be increased. That we may believe and trust in God. And it's a prayer that we would comprehend more and more the surpassing love of God and then serve others as a reflection and an image of Him. I'd like you to notice all these things are not prayed of our own self. I want to be full of the Spirit. I want to have a soul that can see. I want to have... It's not that way. It's a prayer. And did you notice all four times it said, it's asked of God. Only God can do this. Only God can give His Spirit to me. Only God can open my soul to see. Only God will give me strength where I am weak to believe. And only God can let me know and experience His surpassing love and turn me into a reflection of His. This, brothers and sisters in Christ, is a prayer that we would meet God, we would mature in Him, and then we would minister with Him. But this whole process starts off right at the beginning. That all you and I do at the start, is that when God's Spirit reaches out to us, fills us, influences us, and when God embraces us, us, my prayer, and this picture captures it for me, that we would turn to Him, please, and not away. That we'll learn how to turn to Him when He begins to start doing something in our lives. And as we turn to Him and then in my mind, this is the picture, as I turn to God, learn how to open my eyes and see God for who He is and all that He has promised to 
give to impart to us. And then as I turn to him and I open my eyes and I see, then I can stay with him as he increases my strength and then I can serve with him. And that whole pattern, now you can see that completeness and that so-called like a cycle that we can again and again more and more experience. That's my prayer for us. More than praying for exams, more than praying for careers, more than praying for emotions, for families, God has been urging me, pray for this. A spirit to know Him, a soul to see Him, a strength to believe in Him. And understanding is surpassing love that we may serve with Him. It all begins with our meeting, our first encounter with Him. Whether we are a believer or even if we are a non-believer. And I want to just invite you to do that right now. That's a chain reaction that starts with our encounter with God. And this short hymn captured the desire of my heart well. Fill my eyes and I'm asking God to do it. Oh my God. With a vision of of Him, of His cross. Then fill my heart with love for Jesus, the Nazarene. Why bring up the term Nazarene or Nazareth here? Because Nazareth was in many people's eyes an insignificant place. Jesus, to many people, insignificant. But Lord, fill my heart with love for you. Even if it seems like it's not in the way of things to put an emphasis on you. Fill my mouth then with praise for you And let me sing through endless days. Then take my will and take my life and let it be completely yours. Sometimes I wonder when we are gathered together as a church and it seems like, sometimes it seems like it's hard to sing, to let our mouth speak the praise of God and sing. Not even for half an hour, much more say endless days. Then I wonder, is it because I have not yet caught a vision of Christ and of the cross? Having caught a vision of Christ and the cross, is it true that I may not yet have been moved with love for Jesus, but just mere intellectual theory and understanding? But if I can see, if I can sense, then perhaps I'll be able to sing. And notice, the praise of God comes first, before even the service. Before we even talk about serving or sacrificing for God, the first sacrifice is a sacrifice of praise. May this be your prayer. I'm going to invite you now to take this time and to meet with God. Even as I pray now, Lord, let your Spirit pour out onto us. Give us your Spirit that we may know you. And amidst this journey of encountering Him, we will be reminded of the cross that we would grow in our love for Jesus that we would sing His praise and we would serve with all of our life. Let's begin just with your encounter with Him. This time is yours. I invite you again. You may want to just pray. Or if you are already ready, 
can praise.